thank you everyone again for being here. So I'm going to go ahead and present for the first 30 minutes and then uh, Francisco is going to present for the last 30 minutes on financial aid. Um, and so please hold your questions till the very end. My colleagues Sal and Nick will be helping me answer any admissions questions that you have and then Francisco will also be here to answer any financial aid questions that you may have. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. And real quick, um, before we do get started, um, this is a webinar, so um, oh, you will right. have to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions um, that you may have for outreach or financial aid. Right. And, uh, and this presentation is also being recorded, so it will be available on our website uh, in the near future. All right. Uh, can you, my colleagues, confirm that you can see the presentation? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. Let's get started. So California State University has two campuses. So we have a campus uh, in the city of San Bernardino, and then we also have our second campus in the Palm Desert uh, area. So it's called the CSUSB Palm Desert Campus. And so both campuses admit incoming freshmen and upper division transfer students. Uh, the campus in San Bernardino is our largest campus with over 20,000 students. Um, students that make up that student population are undergraduate students students, graduate students, credentialed students, and doctoral level students. We have over 70 uh, majors to choose from at Cal State San Bernardino, uh, with the most popular programs out of those 70 being uh, psychology, criminal justice, nursing, liberal studies, teaching degrees, uh, business, cybersecurity. Um, those are just some of the most popular programs, but again, we have 70 programs to choose from. Um, in our Palm Desert campus, that's a smaller campus, and so about 1,500 students attend that campus, um, and they pretty much offer the majority of the same programs that we offer in the San Bernardino campus. Um, however, they do have one special program that they are the only ones that offer, and the main campus doesn't and that, that's hospitality management. So if you've ever been to the Coachella Valley, the Palm Springs area, it's very much a vacation destination. And so due to a lot of the hotels and resorts that are part of the community there, that's why that um, campus is able to provide that, that program. Um, so just um, a quick you know, um, fun fact about the Palm Desert campus. And then some programs that we wanted to, um, some things that we wanted to highlight about Cal State San Bernardino, a lot of growth is happening on our campus, a lot of changes are, are all around us, and so we wanted to highlight those for you today. So we did just recently get a new student union during um, the year of 2020, 2021, uh, we were building our new student union and now it's officially open. Uh, it opened fall 2022, um, this just last fall, fall 2022. And so just know that that new um, uh, student uh, union is available to you all. It does have a bowling alley and game rooms. Our, our bookstore uh, is now located there. So just a really neat spot for you to hang out, study in between classes or after classes. Uh, we we are also uh, breaking ground on our new Performing Arts Center that's going to open 2024. So this new Performing Arts Center is for our theater arts students. So some other classes are going to be located there. Our play productions that are uh, very much led by our student, uh, our students in theater arts are also going to be um, able to have a new stage and things like that. So we're just very excited about that new new thing that's happening on our campus. Um, we also have a new student center building at Palm Desert Campus, so we're breaking ground for that, so we're expanding that campus as well, um, hopefully building a new student union for the students out there in the Palm Desert Campus, and then we also have the 10 commuter link bus service that is now partnered with um, our local community um, that allows students to have transportation um, free of charge by them showing their student ID card. 
Um, some unique programs that we also wanted to highlight that are unique to our campus would be um, these programs right here, Information Systems and Technology, Business Intelligence, Cybersecurity, and National Security. So these programs are not impacted at Cal State San Bernardino, but they are very popular and are programs that we encourage you to possibly consider. So Cal State San Bernardino is definitely a leading campus when it comes to cybersecurity. Our, our uh, program was one of the very first programs that officially started in the CSU system. And so because um, of our program being so highly recognized and being one of the very first, we are now training other CSU campuses to uh, start their cybersecurity uh, concentrations and programs. And so uh, we do have a unique partnership with the federal government um, where we are able to offer a scholarship that's called Cyber Corps. Um, it's um, anybody that is majoring in any one of these programs is able to apply to that scholarship. 10 students are selected each year. Each student um, gets $20,000 in addition to guaranteed job placement with the federal government once they graduate with these degrees. Um, other unique, thing, unique things about Cal State San Bernardino is that let's say that um, you have to take a language class as part of your general education at CSUSB, um, you could choose one of these Native American languages as your option uh, to meet that language requirement. So we do have a very diverse campus and a wonderful community of Native American students and community members that are partnered with CSUSB. And so that's how we're able to offer these unique languages to meet that general ed requirement as well. Um, also, we were featured on the Netflix show Blown Away. Um, so we do have a unique art program that offers glass blowing as a concentration. And so our professor is featured in this show and they also highlight the program. So if you're curious in the, an art degree and you want to check us out, please check out that show. Um, we're also very excited for anybody that wants to go into physician assistant um, as a degree. We do not offer the undergraduate degree, but we do offer offer the Masters of Science and Physician Assistant Program. We are the very first um, program that's uh, provided um, here in Southern California at a public university. So there's a lot of private universities that offer this program already, but we're the very first public university out of the UCs and the Cal States that's offering this program in Southern California. And then lastly, um, once again, our PDC uh, hospitality management program is another one that, again, we want to highlight that is unique to that campus. And then, um, so what is it that we're looking for in the admissions criteria? So if you're going to be an incoming freshman student, we are looking for your GPA to be competitive. So a competitive GPA for us would be, it ranges year to year, depending on the number of applications. The more applications we receive, the more competitive it's going to be. But typically for our partnership schools, like if we have an MOU with your high school, typically the GPA that we're looking for for non-impacted programs will be a 2.5 and above. Um, with your A through G's pass with a greater C or better. If you're coming from a non-local partnership school, like maybe a high school from San Diego or from Fullerton or Los Angeles, then the GPA does have to be a little bit more competitive. Um, and so typically that GPA is a 3.0 and above with your A through G's pass with a grade or, or C or better. Uh, we no longer require admissions test scores. We no longer require ACT or SAT. Um, however, we do have what's called now the multi multi-factor admission score, MFAS. And so this is nothing extra that you need to do. It's nothing additional that you need to do. Um, all We receive this MFAS score on your behalf based on your answers in the admissions application. So this MFAS score is going to be based off your family income, based off of your GPA, um, and your classes that you've taken, whether they're honors or regular GE classes, uh, general um, uh, a through G classes. So that's where the application is going to generate this MFAS score and assign it to you. But tip, all that you have to worry about is making sure you pass your A through Gs and have that competitive GPA that we're looking for. If you're um, applying to an impacted program, the GPA requirement is different. So it is important that you familiarize yourself with what GPA requirement each of these impacted programs require. And so this QR code can actually take you to the webpage on our website that describes 
describes each GPA for each of these programs. So make sure that you browse through our website and you read what are the specific requirements to apply to one of these impacted programs, um, because they are very competitive, especially nursing. Nursing is going to require two applications, and so it's super important that you go to our website and you check out what is the admissions process for nursing in particular. Okay, and so these are just an example of some of the application numbers that we get each year, um, just to give you an idea. Um, again, we receive um, this many applications this last year, and this is how many we admitted and enrolled. You want to remember that if you are part of a high school that has an MOU, we are saving your seats. As long as you meet that A through G and the GPA requirement, you will have a seat as part of these numbers that you're looking at right here. Now, the admissions requirements for upper division transfer students are different. We are going to be looking at 60 or more transferable units. You do not need to have 60 when you apply, but you need to be on your way to meet 60 requirements. So you do need to indicate that you are in progress to meet your 60 requirements. Um, and then within those 60 units, we are asking for the four golden four to be in, uh, within those 60 units. And so the, old, uh, the golden four classes or the basic skills classes that we need need as prerequisites to be admitted are going to be oral communication, English composition, critical thinking, and college level math. And so those are the only four uh, prerequisites that we require. Of course, if you're applying to one of these impacted programs, you might need additional prerequisites. And so nursing, for example, um, and social work, they're going to require their own specific prerequisites. So again, it's super important that you use this QR code and or that you just Google our, our website and that you check out what are the specific requirements for these particular programs? Um, and this is just an idea of our transfer uh, numbers as well. Same thing for you guys. We have MOUs, we have partnership districts like RCC, um, RCC uh, Norco, uh, Chafee, VVC. So we have specific partnerships with our local community colleges where we are pretty much saving you a seat as, as long as you're meeting these admissions requirements that I talked about. And so um, just to give you an idea about impacted, um, um, oh, sorry about that. So some of the campus resources that we have available here at Cal State San Bernardino, um, we wanna make sure that you're successful, not just in your classes and academics, but that you're also successful with finding resources outside of your academics so that you're somehow, you know, finding ways to get involved and getting the guidance that you need. And so these are the different um, offices or centers that we have on campus that are resource, resources to you as a CSUSB student. And so some of these offices that we wanted to highlight would be the Career Center, where you get help and guidance on building a resume and finding internships within your program or major. We also want to highlight the uh, EOP and Cell Trio program. So these are programs that uh, provide you assistance to be successful in achieving your bachelor's degree. So um, they do check-ins with you, making sure that you're adjusting well to college and that you are picking the right classes every semester. Um, we also wanted to highlight the Undocumented Student Success Center, the Math and Writing Center. So these, this is just a small glimpse of the different resources that we have available to you. Some financial resources at Cal State San Bernardino. So we definitely have financial aid. And so I'm gonna let my colleague Francisco talk more about those resources, but just know that these are some of the unique scholarships that we offer at CSUSB. Once you apply, once you're admitted, then you can apply to these unique scholarships. So some next steps, right? Once you apply to admissions for Cal State San Bernardino, right now our application for fall 2023 is open through csuapply.edu and uh, or calstateapply.edu. And so that application is open from October 1st through November 30th every year. And so your deadline to apply for fall 2023 is going to be November 30th. And after you apply, there's several steps that you need to complete your admissions process, right? It's not just apply, it's also additional steps after that. So this page right here highlights what that progress is and what those steps should be. So make sure that you submit your application by November 30th. Once you submit your application, we will contact you to set up your My Coyote student portal. We're going to provide instructions on how to set that up. And it's important that you do so because that's how you can check the status of 
your admissions decision. Um, and just know that we typically offer admissions decisions anywhere between December and April. So anywhere between those months is when you should be expecting a decision. After you receive your admissions decision, um, you want to also make sure, well, you also want to remember that you're applying for your FAFSA. That application um, is also open. It opened October 1 and it closes March 2nd. Um, but then you also, once you get a decision around December or April, you will have to pay um, a deposit. Um, and so we've been told that this is up in the air. You might not have to pay a deposit anymore, but just in case you do, because uh, typically and historically we have for the last couple of years, typically our enrollment process is $100. Um, but just, just know that when you set up your My Coyote, you will have a to-do list and that to-do list will be accurate and it will tell you whether or not a confirmation deposit will be required. If you don't see it on your to-do list, then it's not required. Um, so only make sure that you're following your to-do list. And then part of that to-do list, you're also going to see final official transcripts are going to be due. So we want to see what grades did you finish your semester at your community college or at your high school? Did you graduate from your high school? Um, you know, what grades did you achieve for this current fall semester and for spring semester? Um, so that's when we are going to add that to your to-do list. And then after you submit transcripts, the very last step is for you to finally attend orientation and meet your academic advisor. So you will get an opportunity to meet the advisor from your major, and they're going to teach you how to register for classes. If you're an incoming freshman, um, your advisor automatically creates your class schedule for you. For transfer students, they're going to teach you how to register for classes, how to understand what classes you need towards graduation. Um, you're going to get what's called a pause report, P-A-W-S, and this report is going to outline every transferable class that you that was within your transcript that you submitted to us, and it's also going to outline what's left of your bachelor's degree with us. And so this is uh, what the, your college advisor is going to teach you uh, when you come to orientation, and they're going to lift your orientation hold, and then you'll be able to register for classes that night as a transfer student. So um, that'll be finally, you'll be done with your to-do list, you'll fully be admitted and you'll have your class schedule and you'll get a little break in between orientation and the first day of classes for fall. All right, guys. Well, um, that um, just know that we have a, a bunch of different resources for you. So you can actually schedule an appointment with our office. You can give us a call and we can help you throughout the application process with CSUSB. And so this QR code takes you to the various um, workshops and, app and presentations that we have coming up, just like you signed up for this workshop here today. Um, so make sure that you're utilizing that QR code or, or that you're calling us directly or using our website to contact us to sign up for additional um, workshops and presentations. Um, and so this is our, um, if you're interested in a campus tour, these are the QR codes for each of the campuses. They do in-person tours and virtual tours as well uh, as Saturday tours. So um, you can use those QR codes or you could just go directly to the tours website. And then this is how you can contact us. So this is our website right here. Our direct contact information is provided there for any questions regarding the admissions process and application. Um, and so just please hold your questions once again. I'm now going to pass the floor to my colleague, Francisco uh, Burgos, who's gonna go ahead and talk about financial aid. Thank you so much. Am I able to share my screen? Let me go ahead and make sure that you can. Give me one Thank second. Hmm. Nick or Sal, are you able to assign uh, Francisco to share his screen? Oh, I think I'm able to. I think okay, I'm able to. Perfect. Awesome. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So let me go ahead and put this on the big screen. And then please let me know if you can or can't see my slide, but I think you should be able to see it. Okay, awesome. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Francisco Burgos, like I mentioned before. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting on financial aid. So if you see me looking up, it's because I have a couple, couple different monitors on my screen. But we are the financial aid office here at Cal State San Bernardino. 
And we're going to get started by telling you what is financial aid and why is it so important, right? So financial aid are programs, right, that provide support for students to help them meet the cost of attendance, uh, cost of obtaining a college education. Funding for such programs is funded by federal and state programs um, and individual colleges and universities and a bunch of other different private and public sources, right? So why is it so important? It's so important because it can help you pay off classes, books, fees, transportation, personal expenses, et cetera. Without financial aid, everything comes out of pocket, right? And becomes really expensive. And college is not something that you could pay out of pocket just to pay for it, right? Um, unless you can, that's totally up to you. If you could get financial aid, it's something that you should do, right? And so where does this come from? At the college and university level, right? It comes from stuff like the state university program, education opportunity program grants, dream loans, institutional scholarships, right? And then some students, for example, um, they might not be able to get financial aid because of their legal status, uh, but others might, right? So depending on your undocumented status, right? There's a bunch of different students that are undocumented, but there's different kinds of undocumented students, right? Some are protected by DACA, some are protected by um, different visas, right? And so there's a bunch of different distinctions between those. And I think it's really important to highlight those just because some students might not know what those are, right? And so from the federal government, right? So this would mean students that are able to do the FAFSA application, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but if you do the uh, federal government, you would be able to get the federal Pell Grant. Maybe you can have the FSCOG Grant, federal student loans. One thing that I really want to emphasize is the difference between these loans here, right? So you have your subsidized loans. Pretty much what those are, they are loans, right, where the interest rate on those do not start to accrue until six months after you graduate, right? Um, as opposed to the other loans here, the unsubsidized Parent Plus and Graduate Plus. All of those begin to accrue as soon as the money is dispersed to you. So if you are a student that's considering loans, the safest one to take out would be the subsidized loan, right? And if you have questions about that, I'd be more than happy to answer questions about that. But just know that if you're looking for a safe loan to take out, subsidized would be the first one that you should take out if it's available to you. Then you also have the federal teach grant. You also have federal work study, right? So federal work study is a program that most, if not all schools have, right? If you're eligible to do work study, it's a $5,000 grant usually where you have to work your way up to that money. So it's not money that's dispersed to you right away. It's money that you earn throughout the year, right? So usually what that means is you would have to get a job on campus. And the good thing about work study jobs is that it considers you as a student first and employee second, right? And so it considers you as a student first. So say for example, you work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but you have Tuesday and Thursday off. You could work during those two those two days, and it prioritizes your schedule first, and then your work schedule. So it's a really nice program. And then you have your state programs, right? So you have Cal Grant. There's a bunch of different things that you could get by doing the FAFSA or the California Dream Act, and these grants are state programs, right? So this means undocumented students are able to get them, as well as students that are filling out the federal applications. So you have the Cal Grant A, you have the Cal Grant B. Cal Grant B for foster youth. There's different ones depending on um, the student's dependency status. Then you have the Chafee for foster youth grant, middle class scholarship, California Dream Act service incentive grant program. So many, so many different options for you that are available to you, right? How do you get those? By filling out one of these two applications, right? So the free application for federal student aid or more commonly known as the FAFSA, right? So what this does is it collects families, personal and financial information and it uses that to calculate the strength of the household financially, right? So this would be determine your EFC or your expected family contribution, right? So this is for US citizen and eligible non-citizens, right? So for students that have a social um, or students that have a green card, they are able to fill out the FAFSA. Like my colleague Melissa mentioned earlier, um, it opens up October 1st and it's open all the way until March 2nd. And you want to do this, right? So it's open until June 30th, but you want to fill it out and complete it by March 2nd, just because that makes you eligible for the Cal Grant if you are able to qualify based on income, right? So it's really important that you do it as soon as you can, because uh, the sooner you do it, the more chances you have of getting institutional aid from universities like us, right? So please make sure you do it as soon as you can. One thing I do want to know is you have to use, for this year, right, if you're filing for next year, you have to use the 2021 tax return. However, if you are applying in a couple of years, right? So say you're applying for fall 2023, or I'm sorry, let's say you're applying for fall 2025, you would use two years before that. So you would use 
fall, you would use 2023 tax returns. So always think two years before the year you're entering. Okay, so for example, your student's going to be entering to 2023. They're going to be using two years before that, which is the 2021 tax return. So that's one way that you can always prepare um, to have your tax information ready. And then you have the California Dream Act application, right? Uh, this one also does the same thing, but this is for state program, right? This is not federally funded, meaning this means that students that are undocumented cannot apply uh, for federal programs, and they would have to do it just for state programs like the Cal Grant. Um, again, this is for eligible undocumented students. And I say eligible, right? Because like I mentioned earlier, there's different undocumented students and undocumented groups. And sometimes students don't know what their undocumented status is uh, because of that. So I'm not gonna go over those specifics because every single student is different and every single student is might have a different undocumented status. So it really depends on what their status is individually. Uh, but this one is the same timeline as the FAFSA. So it opens up October 1st, all the way until March 2nd. Um, and you're gonna use the 2021 tax return as well. So this is what the FAFSA application looks like when you begin. So when you begin, it'll say start here. That's where you'll get started and you'll create an FSA ID. I'll get into what that is right now, but this is something that you have to get used to because you have to do this every single year you're in college. Same thing goes for if you're doing the California Dream Act. You wanna make sure that you do this every single year um, because it doesn't renew on its own. You have to go and do that. And this is an FSA ID, right? So what this is, it's pretty much your username and your password, right? So they just categorize it as one and say FSA ID, but it's pretty much you creating your FSA ID and your username and password. In order for you to do that for the FAFSA, you need to make sure that you have a social security number as well as your own mobile phone number and or email address. One thing I really want to say about this is you want to use a personal email address. Please do not use your high school or your current community college email because it will not be good in a couple months. So it's really important that you use a personal one, right? Like a Gmail, Yahoo, AOL. I would avoid using iCloud just because that gives sometimes a lot of students problems with verifying emails. And believe me, you don't want those problems because then it becomes a little bit difficult to create your account and you wanna avoid that as much as possible. So Gmail, Yahoo, AOL, pretty much anything that isn't iCloud, everything else should work. And then you have the California Dream Act application, right? So whenever you're getting started with this application, one thing that's really cool is when you press first time user, if you're not exactly sure what your legal status is and you wanna figure it out, once you click on start here, it takes you to a little survey that has you fill out the application. It'll say, do you have a social security number? If you do not, you're gonna press no, continue answering the rest of the questions. And it'll determine if you're able to do this one or if you have to do the FAFSA application. If you can't do neither, it'll let you know. Um, so that's one thing that's really cool about this application is that if you're not exactly sure of your legal status, uh, you want to make sure that you can do it this way. And this is something that's also really cool, right? So the IRS data retrieval tool, this is something that is for the FAFSA only. Um, this works usually if you have one parent that has a social security number. If you have one parent that has a social security number, you can create an FSA ID for them and then import all their tax information onto the FAFSA, and it makes the process go so much quicker. It probably takes it from a 30 minute application to around 15, 20 minutes. So you save a pretty good amount of time. Sometimes it might take you longer than 30 minutes, right? If you don't have anybody there helping you, but if you do, I promise you, this is gonna be your best friend. Um, but you have to be very, very, it's very case sensitive, right? Meaning if my name is capitalized on the, um, 1040 document, I need to make sure I capitalize it on this as well. So um, there's a link here. I will share these slides with uh, my colleagues in admissions so they can share it with you all in case you want to look back at this and reference it. This is something I would really consider to taking a picture of uh, just because these are the most common mistakes that we have seen on the application and me personally, what I have seen the most. Uh, so I'll go through them one by one. But the very first one, right, is the name and social security number. I know it seems pretty obvious, right, that your name is your name, but there's a lot of people that misspell their name or um, they will forget to include maybe a second last name or forget to include their middle initial. If you have two last names, it's really important that you know whether your last names are hyphenated or spaced out, right? So say, for example, my name is Francisco Burgos Garcia and it's spaced out. I need to make sure I put Burgos space Garcia or if it's hyphenated, I put Burgos hyphen Garcia, right? 
it has to match your social security number. If it doesn't match, they will let you know it doesn't match and it'll take a little bit longer for you to create your account. So please go based off of what it says on your social security number if you can, at least for the FAFSA. And then you have dependent versus independent status, right? For those of you that are coming out of high school, for the most part, you should be dependent. Um, for community college students, some of you um, live with your parents, right? If you live with your parents, you'll still probably be considered a dependent. However, if you live on your own and you're transferring and you pay your own bills, you pay your own car notes, stuff like that, you have kids, you'll be marked as independent and you won't have to provide parent information. Uh, but for the most part, right, most students would be dependents and they would have to use parental information. One thing that's also really important is who is in the household. So I know sometimes that gets blurred, right? Sometimes people will say, I have an older brother that is 24, 25 years old, right? They live at the house, but my mom and dad don't really take care of him. And then they'll say something like, oh, but my parents pay the bills. They'll pay the rent for him and all this other stuff, but he pays everything else. Technically, if they pay the rent for their, your older brother that's a little older, technically they're still dependent. So that's when it becomes a little bit blurred. So if you have any questions about who's in the household, please don't be afraid to reach out. I can help you guys out with that one. Um, also not reviewing the information. I think these other two are pretty self-explanatory, right? So confusing the student and the parent. On the applications for both of them, at the very top, it tells you which information they're looking for. It'll say student information. It'll say parent information. So please make sure you know which one you're on. And then, for example, if you have two parents, right, let's say you have two parents and uh, one of them has a social, right, you're just going to put their information as is. But let's say the other parent doesn't have a social and they only have an ITIN number, please make sure you don't put that ITIN number, you only put the zeros, right? So they don't have a social, you're putting all zeros across the board for their social security number because they don't have one. Um, and then this is one that I included because this is something I see a lot of not claiming the Cal Grant after choosing the university or college in May, right? So like my folks in admission said, by the time May rolls around, you will have known, you will know which school you're going to be attending. It's important for you to make a Web Grants for Students account, and I'll go into it a little bit later, so that you're able to claim your Cal Grant and your school of attendance, right? But I'll get into that in a little bit. So expected family contribution. This is something that you'll receive after you completed the FAFSA or the California Dream Act. Right, And what this is, it's based on the information that you provided on the applications. It'll get the financial and the household size information, and then it applies it to see how much your family is expected to pay every single year. Right, That's why it's so important for you to get accurate information from your parents' tax returns. The lower the EFC, the higher the financial aid award. Right, So let's say, for example, a student with zero EFC is going to get the maximum funding. But then another student that maybe, for example, has an EFC of let's say 4,000, they'll only be eligible to get around $2,500 in the Pell Grant. So it's give or take, right? So if you have a higher EFC, that means the less money you're gonna be getting. If you have a lower EFC, the more financial aid you'll be getting. So that's kind of how it works in terms of EFC. And it also goes based off of need, right? So how do we calculate need? We go based off the cost of attendance for the school, subtracting the expected family contribution, and then we met with need, right? So usually if a school costs $30,000 and the EFC is around, let's say it's $0, right? Let's say the EFC is zero. They're gonna need $30,000, right? In order to pay for the school. So that's usually how we match it. We usually match it depending on this EFC compared to the cost of attendance. So um, it's really important to try to break that down if you can. Claiming the Cal Grant Award. This is something that, especially the high school students paying attention to this, that you really, really follow these rules. Um, and make sure that you pay attention on how you're doing it, right? So first of all, you're gonna be going and creating a Web Grants for Students account. It looks like this, right? This is what you'll be doing. You'll be creating this account using the same information you put on either the California Dream Act or the FAFSA. Um, and then after you create it, you're gonna confirm a school or make a school change. This won't happen until May. You can do this, I would say four or five days after you do the FAFSA or California Dream Act but you will not choose a school of attendance until May, right? Once you do that, your counselors at your respective schools will send in your high school GPA. And then all you have to do is choose your school of attendance. I know it sounds kind of hard, right? Thinking about it now, like I have to do all these steps. I promise you this takes five minutes. And if you come to Cal State San Bernardino, right? These five minutes will get you $5,742. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good for me for five minutes. Right? So it's really important that you do this step 
So they're able to claim your cows back. Okay, and so again, this is what it's gonna look like. It's gonna ask you for your social or your Dream Act ID, depending on if you do the California Dream Act. You're gonna have to create a username. I would recommend highly to use the same username you used on either the FAFSA or the California Dream Act. That way it's the same exact thing. Uh, name, first initial or middle name, and then last name. If you have two last names, make sure you put it there as well. And then your date of birth, right? So like I mentioned here, if you have two last names, whether hyphenated or separate, make sure you include both last names. And then you have scholarships, right? This is another form of aid that you can get individually. These are usually private, right? But then you also have campus ones, but you won't be able to apply to those until you're a student. Each school has their scholarships, right? So you wanna make sure you take a look at that when you can. Um, but then these are a couple of places you can look at, right? The college you plan to attend, whichever that is. Hopefully it's Cal State San Bernardino, right? But then you also have um, a bunch of other stuff that you can apply for. Contact your high school counselor, maybe your parents' employers. I can't tell you how many parents have um, in their respective employer employment that have scholarships available for their children. So take a look at that. You also have FastWeb, local corporations, right? That might be offering any scholarships. So take a look at those too. This is the financial aid process, right? And I kind of want to describe this a little bit more, right? So anywhere from October 1st to March 2nd, you're going to be filing the FAFSA or the California Dream Act. Once that's submitted, students in the college will receive the SAR, right? The student aid report. So this is where we're going to use to determine how much financial aid we're going to give you based off of that EFC. Sometime in between uh, submitting your application and being admitted, the schools will let you know if you need to turn in any verification documents, right? So this is usually if we need more information from you uh, to determine uh, your financial aid package. So this includes stuff like maybe household size, um, submitting proof of documents in terms of tax returns, right? This is something that might happen, but you never know. It might not, it, it might happen to you. It usually happens at random. Um, so if you're selected for this, it's important to check your portal account. Check your portal account, check your to-do list because if we're not asking you for something, admissions might, right? So it's really, really important to check your to-do list. And then come around March, April, the schools will award the student, right? This means that we will give you uh, a financial aid award package, which I'll get into, and it'll explain how much aid we're going to be giving you, at least offering. And then if you choose to like that award, you could accept it, and then you accept it, you get the money dispersed around August, and then again, the same process continues the next year. So it's a continuous cycle that you have every single year. So please make sure you keep your stuff up to date with financial aid because I promise you it makes it a little bit easier. We're trying to help you, right? We're not trying to take money away from you or keep money from you. We want to give you financial aid, but you need to work with us as well because it is a little difficult just because there's so much stuff involved. And then you have your special circumstances and income appeals, right? So we understand that sometimes stuff happens, right, from year to year. So say in 2021, when you filed your taxes and you did the, FAP, the FAFSA, right? Your income was probably much higher than what it is now when you submitted, right? So this means that this won't reflect what you have now. If that's the situation that you're in, you would need to come into your financial aid office and explain the situation to us, right? Because we want to give you this financial aid. But in order for us to do that, we need to be aware of the situation. So that's when stuff like this happens, right? Say you have a different, um, say you become, right, a foster youth from last time to now, somebody who passes away in your family, right? Loss of income or reduction and then loss of benefits, right? These are all stuff that can apply to an income appeal or special circumstances, but you need to contact your school's financial aid office because we won't be made aware of that until you come to us. So an award letter, right? This is something that I believe all high school stu all, all students should know how to do just because this really determines how much you're gonna be paying out of pocket if you have to pay anything at all, right? So what is it? An award letter is a financial aid package that shows you, the student, how much financial aid you are going to receive for the upcoming year, broken down by year. So here, if you look to the right, as well as by semester. So fall and spring. It's important for you to understand this, right? Because in order to determine your costs, you should compare your award letter to your cost of attendance. So you know how much you're gonna have to pay or how much your money you'll get back if applicable, right? So sometimes students will get more financial aid than what they need to pay for the cost of the school and they'll get a refund, right? That refund, you can use it for books, you can use it for a laptop, you can use it for maybe buying a bus pass, whatever it is that you might need it for. Um, but be really smart with that money because you only get it twice a year if you're going to a semester school. So 
Again, like I mentioned, these will be released in March or April. So let's take a closer look at this, right? This is a, an example, a word letter. This is what it might look like for some of your other schools. This is what it looks like for Cal State San Bernardino. So this student right here is only offered grants, which is a good thing, right? Anything that has a word grant or scholarship at the end of it is free money. You don't have to pay this back, right? So you never ever have to pay grants or scholarships back. That is money that is given to you, the student. If it says loan at the end of it, then yes, you do have to pay that back. But, right, if you are offered loans, you don't need to accept them. You'll only need to accept the loans if you need extra money, right? So loans are usually like on the last resort basis if you need the money to pay for your classes, right? But if you do not manually accept these loans, then the loans won't be dispersed to you and you won't owe anything at all. So the only way you'll be able, you'll have to pay loans back is if you take that money out. So just be very careful when you're accepting your awards because grants and stuff are already accepted because it's free money, but loans is something you have to do manually. So if you ever tell us, right, oh, I did it by accident. No, you didn't, right? We know for sure that students go in there and they look at the loans, determine if they need it or not, and then they accept it. So just be very careful when you're taking out loans. So if you're going to come to Cal State San Bernardino, you're going to be able to find it, right, under My Financials on My Coyote. After you click on My Financials, it'll take you here. And then you can click on View My Financial Aid. And then it'll take you to the current year, right? So for some of you, it's going to look like 2024. You go ahead and click on this part, and then it'll take you to this here, OK? So that's pretty much everything. Uh, this is the contact information for here at Cal State San Bernardino for our office. We are in University Hall 150. This is the office phone number if you have any questions for us, as well as our email and our website. And again, I'll share these slides with you all. But if you have any questions for me as the Financial Literacy and Wellness Coordinator, this is my contact information as well as my office phone number. So I'm always open to answering questions whenever you have them. Um, so please give me a call or email me, and I'd be more than happy to help. But that's all I have. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen uh, to try to answer any questions if there are any other questions.